Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone. We are so glad that you are here today. If you could please find your seats, it's time for the morning announcements. If this is your first or second time here at Cornerstone, would you please meet us at the guest center directly out the back doors of the auditorium? We'd love for a chance to meet you, get to know you a little bit better, and give you a gift to show you how much we appreciate you being here with us today. Here at Cornerstone, we love God, we love others, and one of the ways we do that is through our giving. If you would like to give today, you can always do so online using your church center app or in person using a drop box in the back of the auditorium. Because you give, we can serve. It is once again time for Operation Christmas Child. Make sure you grab yourself a box, you fill out the card, load it with toys for a boy or a girl and for whatever age range you select, but let's bless these kids around the world. Speaking of blessing kids, Trunk or Treat is coming up on October 30th. Make sure that you get signed up on Church Center to host a trunk. There's gonna be a prize, trophy for the winner whoever the public votes as the best trunk make sure you're here at 4 30 at 5 p.m starts our trunk or treat time for uh, children with special needs and then at six to seven is the traditional trunk or treat we want you to be a part of it make sure you get signed up on church center hello church family i'm here to speak to you about the best thing happening in october it's pastor appreciation month here are some ways you can show love and appreciation to our pastors throughout the entire month. They like cards with or without gifts attached. They like gift cards. There's a box in the lobby to drop off cards and gifts. You can send a monetary gift through the Church Center app or drop in the church office anytime with your goodies. Happy pastor appreciation to our wonderful Cornerstone staff. And that is it for the announcements this week. For more information and to stay up to date with what's going on here at Cornerstone, make sure you check out a paper bulletin out in the lobby, or you can always check out your church center app. We love you. Have an amazing day. Good morning, Cornerstone. How are we this morning? Good. We're going to enter into a time of worship. Would you please stand with us?
sing a little louder, 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 oh, sing a little louder, sing a little louder. about how worthy he is of our praise, right? Man, there's just, there can be so many things um, in our lives that take um, our minds away from him that just kind of distract us. But this next song we sing, it's called Worthy of It All. It just kind of reminds me that no matter what's going on, he's worthy of it all, amen? And, it, and the words of this song are straight from the Bible. They're straight from Revelation, right? If you look up those words to this song, you'll, you'll find a Bible verse. And it's just such a beautiful picture of the saints and angels sitting around the throne, um, casting their crowns before him and saying, you're worthy of everything. These beautiful, honorable uh, beings and people that we would think, wow, those people are amazing. And they're humbling themselves at Jesus' feet, amen? That's a powerful picture. And so today, as we sing this song, I want us to just keep that in the forefront of our minds that God is worthy of it all, no matter what's going on in our own lives, that he never stops. He never stops being good. He never stops being faithful. He never stops being just. And so this morning, let's just sing out to him that he is worthy of it all, amen. God. 
Jesus, as today we take this time to worship you. We, we don't have actual crowns to lay at your feet, but symbolically through our worship today, we take all that we have and we lay it before you. All of our desires, our rights, our wants, even our needs, we place them before you and we worship you and we say, you are worthy. We put our trust in you. We thank you, God, that you are uh, sovereign over all, that you are our strength, that you are our song. And so we put our trust in you today. Father, I pray that you would meet with each one of us here in this place. I know that there are a variety of circumstances that we walk into this room with, so I pray you would help us. As we've just spent this time worshiping you, help us to recognize that you are ruling over creation. You are sovereign over all that takes place. And so, Father, I pray you'd help us to put our trust in you. And as we've taken this time to worship you and lift you up, as we transition to a time of looking at your word, uh, may we be challenged and changed and convicted so that we can ultimately become the people that you desire us to be. We don't want to just be here and leave the same. We want to encounter your presence in a powerful way and do that now. You've done it through our time of worship. Now do it through our time in the word. Change our hearts, open them up so we can receive and then give us what we need to live it out, to make a difference in the world around us, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, God bless you. You can uh, take a seat. It is great to see each of you who are here today. Man, I am so grateful for what the Lord is doing in our church. And I'm grateful for all the different uh, people that help us accomplish what we do here on, on Sundays. A um, couple things before we get into the message. Uh, I just want to uh, remind you, uh, today is the third Sunday of the month. And that means that today is... Mission Sunday. And um, so every uh, third Sunday of the month, we take a moment to just remind you about what the Lord is doing uh, through our church and other organizations all around the world. And so today we are focusing on the Christmas boxes that are out in the foyer. This is part of Operation Christmas Child. This is our Christmas shoebox. I know it's October, it seems a little early for Christmas, but what we do is we have you take these boxes, you fill them up with all sorts of of toys and goodies, and uh, they are distributed all across the globe to children in need, and there's a gospel presentation that goes along with that. And so what we're asking you to do this month is to go ahead and take one of those, yes, in October, uh, because they're going to be due back on November 13th, where we are going to put them on a truck, and they are going to be shipped and sent out all around the, the, the world. So please, please, please make sure that you get those boxes in by November 13th. Because once the truck leaves, they become sad little Christmas boxes that have to stay and wait until next year. Okay, so please get those in on November 13th. But if you would, take one or two, uh, maybe take one for each child in your, in your house. Or maybe you just want to get a bunch of boxes and bless a bunch of kids. There are instructions out there. There's different age groups. You pick a box. Uh, you get uh, toys for a boy or toys for a girl. Uh, and all the instructions are out there. Linda Logston, I believe, is out there helping us with that today. So I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Now, uh, several months ago on a, uh, on a third Sunday of the month, one of our missions Sundays, we had uh, a missionary who does work right here in Illinois in our schools, a guy named Billy Willis, uh, part of Youth Alive. And uh, he came and he talked to us about how his, his mission, his calling is to help students become missionaries to their schools and make a difference on their campus. And uh, we have some students at Trimpey Middle, Middle School who decided they wanted to start a, a campus club meeting, a, a Youth Alive campus club meeting on their campus. And so they started it. They got approved, I think on October 6th. They had their first meeting this past week and there were 33 Three students in attendance. I think we have a picture. 33 students in attendance. And so I bring that up to, yes, celebrate what God's doing through our middle schoolers, but to just remind you, hey, like part of your missions giving is going to Billy, who's helping to invest in our students, not just here, all across the state to be able to start these kinds of uh, campuses and clubs. As we say all the time, because you give, 
we can serve. And uh, I want to encourage you today, if you've never given before, I want to encourage you to start giving. Maybe you're going to start by picking up one of those boxes and start uh, filling that up. Maybe you want to give to Cornerstone in particular or to missions in general. Um, but because you give, you are then a part of what God is doing all over the place. And I believe that God blesses us when we give. When we're faithful, he responds. So I just want to say one other item. Uh, I forgot to mention this first service, but we are doing our annual trunk or treat coming up on October 30th. And as we mentioned uh, in the announcement videos and online, we are going to be doing a, a trunk or treat at five o'clock for children or families that have children with special or sensory needs. And right now, just in a week or two of having our signups, we've got 15 families families that have signed up for that to, to start at five o'clock. So I wasn't sure, like, are we going to have any? We've got 15 families already that have signed up. So if you're aware of families, uh, children that have special needs or sensory needs, tell them about that. We'll help you guys get them set up, signed up. And we want to bless these folks in our community. Well, when I was in high school, uh, I had a uh, English teacher in my sophomore year who, of course, had us read a, ver a variety of different books and things, and uh, uh, we watched a few movies in class as well. And uh, my teacher would oftentimes, I think she liked to watch the movies in class because she would pause it and she would point out different themes that were being developed or different literary devices that were going on along the way. But one of her favorite things to say during a movie would she'd stop it or she would just call it out in the middle. She would say the words, Christ imagery. And uh, it kind of became a little bit of a joke to our class because she would say it all the time. Whether it was a book we were reading, she would point it out or she would read it or whether it was in the movies. Well, my sophomore year, uh, we watched a movie in class, the movie Cool Hand Luke. Anybody familiar with Cool Hand Luke? Don't show that image yet, by the way, guys. But uh, Cool Hand Luke was the one where she just went crazy with the Christ imagery comments. She would just yell it out. And um, I think some of it was maybe a little bit of a stretch, but um, there was one scene in particular she talked about, and I don't know, I don't know if any of this is true, but she talked about how cool, Luke, cool Hand Luke, Luke was walking somewhere, and they had built a ramp that was out of the sight of the camera, and so it's subtle, but as he's walking, he's going up to wherever he was going. And it was like, uh, and like an image of the ascension. He was rising up to this place. I, I don't know if that was actually what they did or not, but she was convinced. And so she yelled out Christ imagery and explained that to us. But there is a famous scene uh, where Luke uh, has to eat 50 eggs. It's kind of this ridiculous thing. He eats these eggs and he's, he's stuffed, he's full, he's passing out and he's tired. And all the guys are around cheering him on as he's finishing eating eating these uh, 50 hard-boiled eggs, and they lay him down, and we see Cool Hand Luke right there in the shape of Jesus. Now, I didn't show this image uh, for service, and my wife said, the students are not going to know who Cool Hand Luke is. I'm like, yeah, but that's Paul Newman with his shirt off, and I don't know about that. And she's like, show the picture. So we showed the picture. So take the picture off now. I can't let it linger too long. All right. But this image, this kind of, you can take it off, really, though. Uh, <laughs> it's making me uncomfortable. Um, uh, this image, though, is very common in, uh, certainly in art, you know, pictures of Jesus and that, you know, but it's common in movies. Uh, you can see all sorts of Christ imagery in different films, whether it's panning out and seeing the crossroads of streets in the shape of a cross, whether it's the main character having a, 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 you know, stretching their arms out like this or a main character dying to save everyone else. Christ imagery shows up in a lot of different places in pop culture, in art, in these different kinds of ways. So why is this? Why does this take place uh, in so many different ways in so many different places? Well, as I said last week, there is something captivating and moving about the cross. In spite of the fact uh, that it is a symbol of horror and shame and torture. It's, it's this weird mixture of things. There is an idealism and I even could say an attractiveness in Jesus's selfless, sacrificial death that inspires people to reflect that in different ways in their art. And so many of these authors or these artists, they probably don't necessarily even uh, follow Jesus or pretend like they are trying to follow him, but they're inspired and moved by what his death represents. And so today we're finishing a series of messages called Journey to the Cross. Last week, uh, we read about Jesus being placed on the cross and we saw the mocking that was taking place as he hung there. And today in our text, we're gonna arrive at Jesus's death. 
Uh, this is the source. This, this scene here that we'll look at is the source of the Christ imagery that's so popular uh, in these artistic expressions that we've talked about. Today, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 through 54. And, you know, it's one thing for us to say that we see uh, Christ uh, imagery in pop culture, but it is another thing, and it's much more important for us to see this Christ imagery in Jesus himself in our text here today. And as followers of Jesus, if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, uh, what we see here should lead us to worship Jesus. But more than that, it should lead us to ask questions about how we should live now in light of what he has done for us. So our text starts here in verse 45. It says this, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Now, remember, uh, last week, the verses before this told us that Jesus was put on the cross. And now Matthew tells us that three hours have passed. Think about this. Three hours of Jesus hanging there on the cross. He's been uh, beaten. He's been whipped. His body is torn apart. Blood loss, exhaustion. He has, he's been up the night before. He's been hanging there for three hours. Crucifixion was a horrible and a humiliating way to die. Uh, and depending on how the prisoner was treated, they, the, the prisoner on the cross may live several days even. Some prisoners were not flogged like Jesus was. Others were just tied to the cross. They weren't nailed to the cross. And so all these factors it, uh, would determine how long someone was alive. But here, Jesus, at least a minimum of three hours that he's been here. And I think it's important for us to note here that Matthew, Matthew's gospel, the way he's been telling this, he's been slowing down the narration. If you look back at Matthew chapters uh, one and two, you read about Jesus's birth and childhood. And it's just a, a quick snippet that we see there, just two chapters that cover over uh, a pretty extensive period of time, but just his birth and then his early childhood, just a brief scene there. And then we move from chapters 30 through chapter 20. And actually there's a gap. There's like 30 year gap in between there. Chapters three through 20 cover Jesus's ministry. But then back in chapter 21, Matthew slows down the narrative. We're in chapter 27 now. From chapter 21 to, to this point is just about a week's amount of time. So Matthew is slowing down the narrative. And he's now moving from not talking about days, but hours. He's slowing it. It's like Matthew has a slow motion camera. And he wants us to take in all of the different elements of what's happening around the cross. One of those things that's happening at the cross here is that darkness has covered the land. Matthew tells us that the sky has grown dark. And this is not like just heavy cloud cover or some kind of a natural occurrence. Something else is going on here. And Matthew recognizes that this is another place where the events surrounding Jesus' death, it's another place where it's fulfilling the Hebrew scriptures. This is a, I like to call a hyperlink back to the prophet Amos. Amos wrote in chapter eight of his book, verses nine and 10, he wrote this. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. This is exactly what's happening here in, in Matthew's gospel. Verse 10, I will turn your religious festivals into mourning and your singing into weeping. Remember that Jesus's death is occurring on the Passover, one of their festivals. Again, another link back to the prophet here. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. An only son, the only son of God on a cross. All these connections back to what Amos is saying here. Now, in addition to that passage with Amos, darkness recalls all sorts of images from the Old Testament. Uh, the darkness, for, in, for example, that covered the surface of the deep at creation, or maybe the darkness that occurred for three days as a plague against Egypt when Egypt was enslaving God's people. Darkness throughout the Hebrew scriptures is a sign of God's judgment. But what happened after each of those situations? After the darkness of Genesis came the light of creation. After the darkness in Egypt, God came down, passed over his people, protecting them, and he redeemed his people from captivity. Darkness in judgment in the Hebrew scriptures resulted in God's vindication, the vindication of his holiness and his name. And it, it, it resulted in the, re, in the revelation of his might. 
You see, we, as we read this here, seeing what Matthew's saying about darkness, we anticipate something is going to happen. We anticipate that there's going to be like the, the light of a new dawn. But before that comes, darkness persists. Because what Matthew records is not just outer darkness that occurs in the skies, but also in inner darkness as well. Look at verse 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There, there is so much that is packed into this one verse here, and I'm going to try to unpack it the best way I can. Let's just start with that strange language there. What's that about? Matthew is writing his gospel in Greek, and uh, Jesus would have been speaking Aramaic. So what that means is that Matthew, when he decided to write it down in Greek, that was the common language that, had, uh, that most people spoke. So he's writing it in a way that can reach the most people. So what Matthew's doing is he's translating Jesus's Aramaic words into Greek all throughout the gospel up to this point. In fact, throughout the entire gospel, he translates everything except this one sentence, except for this one line. Now, why does he do that? I think it's because Matthew wants to pre preserve Jesus' words as closely as he can. Because Matthew sees these words as absolutely important. They're critical for him to communicate to us. But let's be honest, as important as they are for Matthew, they're very uncomfortable for us today. You know, when we think of Jesus on the cross, we might expect Jesus to make some sort of declaration on the cross. God is love and I am the expression of it. Or I am the son of God, maybe we would expect him to say. Or may there be peace on earth. Or hey, I know I am dying right now, but don't worry, I'm going to come back to life. We might expect him to make that kind of a statement, but instead we don't get a statement, we get a question. And not just any question, we get a hard question. We get a why question. Parents in the room, you know that with a little bit of research, you can answer uh, the, the what and the how questions that your kids have. But the why questions... Those are more difficult. And that's the question that Jesus has here on the, on the cross. Why is, why, why is this happening? So what's happening here? Is God really, really abandoning his son? Would God do that? Or, or maybe, as some people have, have considered, maybe Jesus just feels like he's being abandoned, but God's not really abandoning him. You know, is there really a difference, though, if you're feeling abandoned or whether or not you actually are? So it's obvious that something significant is happening here, but Matthew, he's just not interested in explaining it to us theologically. He's just telling us what happens. Now, here we are with seeing Jesus at his lowest and his most difficult moment. He calls out here, and what is he saying? What are these words? They're not his own words, but they're the words, again, of the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus is calling back to Psalm 22. This is a psalm that's been showing up recently in the last couple of uh, sections of text that we've looked at. Psalm 22 is an important psalm in, in understanding what is happening here to Jesus. And the first verse of Psalm 22 says, My God, my God, uh, why have you forsaken me? And so Psalm 22, it starts out really bleakly, but then it ends in triumph. And so because this is such a difficult statement, uh, some scholars have speculated. They said, well, man, I really feel uncomfortable with this whole God abandoning Jesus thing. So maybe, maybe Matthew just records that Jesus only said verse one, but maybe, maybe Jesus actually quoted the entire Psalm and got to the triumph at the end. And others might say, well, no, it doesn't mean that he quoted the whole thing, but there is a way of, of Hebrew uh, Jewish um, citation. When the Jewish people would cite something, often they would cite one passage or a verse and the rest was implied. And so some say, well, maybe he just quoted the first verse to kind of just imply everything that follows all, to way, all the way to the very end. And that's possible, but I don't think that squares with the, the narrative that Matthew has been presenting to us. Think about what's been happening to Jesus up to this point. Jesus has been abandoned at every turn. He's been abandoned by his country. He's been abandoned by his disciples. He's been abandoned by the crowds. And now it's culminating in what author and pastor Tim Keller calls a cosmic abandonment of God uh, on the cross or from God on the cross. See, I think this is uh, an uncomfortable statement for us to think about 
this idea that God is abandoning Jesus like this in his most desperate state. And it's hard for us to understand. Thankfully, later on, the Apostle Paul will explain this theologically. And so this is what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He says, God made him, speaking of Jesus, God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. At the cross, Jesus took on our sin and sin and God cannot coexist. And so our sin that Jesus took on separated him from the father. I think when Jesus was in the garden and he was praying, oh, could there be another way? Is there, if, I'll do your will, but if there's another way, I don't think Jesus was worried about the whiplashes. I don't think Jesus was stressing about the nail marks in his hands or the jeering or the mocking. I think it's this moment when he took on the sins of the world and he felt that separation, that cosmic abandonment. I think that's what Jesus was praying about. That was what was most on his mind. He bore the consequences of our sin so that we might be redeemed and restored into relationship with the Father. But as I said, Matthew is not concerned with spelling this all out theologically. Instead, I think Matthew is more focused on the practical sort of discipleship oriented aspect of this. Uh, Frederick Dale Bruner puts this really, really well in his commentary. He writes this, Jesus's last words before death, teach us the gospel within the gospel. They tell us that Jesus took our abandonment, our questions, our feelings of God's betrayal, our most agonizing experiences. And still he believed in the God he could not feel and was surely tempted to disbelieve. You see, Jesus may have been questioning God's presence, but he still refers to him as my God. Jesus is not faltering in his faith here on the cross. In fact, he's modeling true faith. Faith that believes in God even when we don't see him or when we don't feel him. And what's more, he's experiencing what we experience and he's trusting the Father. Haven't you had those moments where you say, oh God, where are you? Oh God, how, how did this happen? Oh God, what? I don't feel your presence anymore. He understands and he identifies with our questions and our feelings. Verse 47 when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Now, Elijah's story is found in 1 Kings and at the very beginning of 2 Kings in the Hebrew scriptures. In 2 Kings chapter two, we read that Elijah didn't die, but he was taken up into heaven. Because he didn't die and he was taken into heaven, uh, there was amongst some Jews, there was this belief that Elijah was like a patron saint who would come to the aid of those people who were in need. And so perhaps some people in the crowd, when they heard him saying, a lie, a lie, perhaps they thought he was talking about Elijah and they think that, that Jesus is just trusting Elijah to come and help him. Verse 48. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge and he filled it with vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. So this is the second time that Jesus has offered a drink on the cross. Uh, and if you remember uh, last week, we talked about the previous drink. Uh, that drink contained uh, gall or, or bile. Uh, and this one uh, contains vinegar. Now, if you remember last week, we talked about how, how this was another fulfillment, uh, a hyperlink back to the Old Testament to Psalm 69, where the psalmist is given food with gall and vinegar. So the first cup had gall. This one has vinegar. So this is completing the fulfillment of that uh, passage in Psalm 69. And, and last week we said that it was an act of cruelty. And it's possible that this uh, is an act of cruelty as well, but it might be that this one person has some compassion on Jesus. Or maybe Jesus's death and the darkness and the events that are surrounding it are beginning to make an impact on the crowd. Regardless, the rest of the crowd at large barely tolerates it and they essentially tell the person to sit down, be quiet, and let's see what happens to this guy on the cross here. Verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Now, some of the other gospels tell us what Jesus said when he cried out, but again, Matthew's not focused on those details. Instead, he just tells us that Jesus cried out and he gave up his spirit. It's kind of a strange way of saying that you died uh, or someone died. You can say it this way, but it's not the normal way of saying it. And so Matthew seems to be telling us that Jesus died while he was in full control of his senses. Uh, of, of his senses. Now, when someone was crucified, 
part of the torture and part of the challenge of crucifixion was the way you were hanging on the cross. Because of the, 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 the pressure, it was difficult to breathe, especially if you had been whipped uh, with the pain of the, of the nails and your hands and feet. And so to breathe, you would have to pull up with your arms or push down with your feet in order to be able to expand your chest to be able to have the freedom to be able to breathe, breathe freely. And so obviously that would be very painful pushing against those nails uh, that were attaching you to the cross. And so crying out in a loud voice like this would take uh, significant effort and control. And Matthew's painting this picture showing us that Jesus is not panicking. He's not hopeless and in despair. He's believing in the Father's plan and he's willingly following it even when he can't feel him. And so here it is. He, he, he brings himself to this point and he calls out in a loud voice and then Jesus dies. This is the high point of the tension. Jesus has been predicting that this was going to happen for chapters now. We know this as the readers. We, and and, many, and all, most of us in the room, we know what happens afterwards, but we know what's going to take place. We've been anticipating this, but here it is, the high point of tension. You have darkness over the land. You have Jesus is dead. God is seemingly absent. And then what, what's gonna happen next? It's like, it's like a cliffhanger here. And we, we're like anticipating Jesus, he's died, the darkness, God seems gone. What's gonna happen next? I'm gonna read the next three verses all together, but I want you to see what happens in rapid succession here. Look at verse 51. At that moment, right then and there, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. I mean, there's an immediate response here. It's almost as if you see Jesus' breath leaves his body and then bang, all of this stuff starts to happen. If Jesus felt that God was absent before, now God is making himself known to everyone in the vicinity. There's three different things that occur right here. The first is that the, the temple curtain is torn. Now, there are two different curtains in the temple. One is uh, separating kind of the outside from the, in, from the sanctuary. And then there's a second curtain that separates the sanctuary from the Holy of Holies. And it's this second curtain that is being referred to here. This was a massive curtain. It was 60 to 80 feet high. And, you know, a curtain like this doesn't just rip from top to bottom by itself. It was a supernatural event. I almost envision God reaching down to, and ripping the curtain with his hands like that. Now, the curtain's purpose was to essentially keep people out. Only one person would go past that curtain, and that only happened once a year during uh, the Day of Atonement, or Yom, Yom Kippur. And so the high priest was the only one that would go in there. He'd offer a sacrifice on behalf of all the people. And so that curtain was a, a barrier between uh, the, even the rest of the priests, not to mention the people, and their access into God and his presence. Uh, again, I've, you know, Frederick Dale Bruner is just on fire this week. So I've got a couple quotes from him. So just deal with it. I know some of you look forward to the Bruner quotes, but he, he, he's, so, he's so great here in how he articulates this. The split veil of the temple says two truths about the temple. One, judgment, it's all over. And two, salvation, it's all open. So let's talk about those two things. First, judgment it's all over. Now, back in chapter 23, Jesus predicted the end of the temple. If, if you remember, you look back at the end of chapter 23, Jesus said that it was going to be left desolate. And so what we're seeing here in verse 51 of our chapter here is that this is beginning to come to pass. Jesus's death is the beginning of the end for the temple system. It's not needed anymore because Jesus's sacrifice is sufficient to cover all sins for all humanity for all time. So it's judgment on the temple and the way that it's been run, but it's also salvation. So it's not just that it's all over, now it's all open. Jesus' death on the cross opened a way for all people now to be able to enter into, the, into relationship with God. The barrier's been removed, and it's not just that we now have access to God's presence, but then what happens uh, just day, weeks after this, on the day of Pentecost, you have God's presence uh, unleashed and living and dwelling inside of people. So it's not just that we go into his presence. That curtain symbolizes God's presence going out through his people to make a difference in the world. That's the first sign. The second sign that Matthew mentions is an earthquake. 
And the key here is to recognize that Jesus' death wasn't just a spiritual event. It had a physical impact on creation itself. The rocks shattered and broke apart. The creator stepped in and began the work of recreation. The earthquake here is a physical reaction to the spiritual realities that Jesus had accomplished. The third sign comes now as a result of that earthquake. These tombs broke open and we're told that holy ones, people that had died, came back to life. I mean, this is wild to think about. Several different Old Testament passages talk about this sort of thing occurring in, a, in a, an apocalyptic kind of way. Daniel chapter 12, Isaiah chapter 26, Ezekiel chapter 37. And the key here is to recognize that Jesus' death not only cancels sin, but it conquers death itself. Now look, we know uh, that in three days, Jesus is gonna raise to life again. But his resurrection is different than what's happening with these people. Uh, we use the word resurrection to talk, what, to talk about what happened to these people, but a better word might be resuscitation. These people were resuscitated. They came back to life. But Jesus, when he was resurrected, comes into a new body. It's a new creation that's taking place. And, and what I, what's, what's wild about this scene with these people coming back to life, we know about the hope of resurrection. And it's almost like creation itself can't contain itself. It's got to start reacting already. Jesus has died and all of a sudden the rumblings of new creation and life and resurrection is beginning. And it's shown in the resuscitation of these people. Now we can summarize what happens in these three verses with these three signs into two different categories. Jesus' death results in spiritual transformation and physical transformation. When he dies, spiritual things are transformed and physical things are transformed. Spiritually, everything changed when Jesus died. Jesus was the sacrifice on our behalf and now all people can enter into relationship with the Father. But the physical world felt the impact as well. Again, one more Bruner quote. He says this, matter matters. I love that. Matter matters. God made it in creation, took it on in incarnation, and raises it again in resurrection. Bodies are not immaterial or unimportant to the biblical God. They matter so much that God raises them. What we have here is a glimmer of the beginning of the new creation. You read the end of the book and you see that the promise is, is that God's not going to take us all the way to some spiritual uh, disembodied place. What does he say at the end, the last two chapters of the, the scriptures? There will be a new heaven and a new earth and the city of God, the new Jerusalem will descend and God will be with his people. He is reordering and recreating. God is not just the one that creates, he's the one that can recreate as well. And we see the beginnings of that right here. God raises these people to reveal what he wants to do, not just with you and I in the end, but with all of creation as well. He wants to raise everything new and back the way it should be. Verse 54, when the centurion and all those with him, uh, with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of of God. Now, throughout Matthew's gospel, Matthew has highlighted several different times where Gentile outsiders get it right, where, whereas the Jewish insiders that should know, they miss it. At the beginning of uh, Matthew's gospel, it starts with the Gentile magi, uh, outsiders who come in and they honor Jesus at his birth. And now right here at the end, we have Gentile soldiers honoring Jesus at his death. You know, Matthew is writing this down for a reason. He's writing down uh, this, uh, scholars think between the years 60 and 80 is when Matthew probably wrote down his gospel. Um, I tend to think that it was after the year 70, after uh, when Jerusalem was destroyed, just because of some of the themes that are in here. And so Matthew is writing to a group of people and he's reminding them about what is happening. And he's putting these, he's writing to a Jewish audience, a largely Jewish audience, but he's adding these things about Gentiles in to remind them to say, look, this is not just an ethnic story for us. This is not just something that we need to keep amongst our own ethnic group of, of Jewish people. He's, he's reminding them that the message of the gospel is not to be contained. The purpose of this is to go out and to share this good news. The, the world needs to know about this. The message must be spoken, but the message also must be lived. 
And so Matthew is writing this to this church and he's calling to them, are you going to follow this Jesus? And he's calling to us today. He's writing to us saying, will we follow Jesus? You remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. You know, pop culture seems to have a fascination sometimes with Christ imagery. We can find all sorts of examples. Just start Googling it. Let's see it all over the place. But I wonder, in the midst of the fascination that people have and all the Christ imagery we can see in these uh, artistic examples all around us, movies and TV, I wonder if people see Christ imagery in us. I, I wonder if when, you know, my teacher, when we would watch these movies, she would literally like yell out in class, Christ imagery, right like that. And I wonder like if people observe our lives, if they don't go, Christ imagery, do they see that in us? Or is there only, is there only uh, time they see that is in a movie when Cool Hand Luke lays down? Or do they really see us? You know, I've been really um, taken by that passage. That call, uh, most of my Christian life, whenever I read those passages about taking up your cross and following him, it just, it stops me in my tracks. And, and, and this week, as I've been preparing for this, I, I, I got stopped again, but for a different way. Because for me, I think about that phrase, take up my cross and follow Jesus. And I just think, like, I just got to keep walking. I just got to follow cross. Jesus didn't walk with his cross forever. It got put in the ground and he got put up on it and he died. And it struck me. Now, look, we don't die, you know, for the sins of humanity. Okay, Jesus did that for us. But church we are to carry our cross to the point that it leads us to selflessness and dying to ourselves. It, 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 we don't get to carry the cross uh, just a little bit and say, no, nah, it's a little too hard now and I'm over and I'm done. Church, we are called to, to take up our cross and follow him and to plant it in the ground and to selflessly give of ourselves sacrificially, to die to ourselves. And when we do this, when we do this, things should change. I want us to reflect on this question today. Does my life reflect the image and actions of Jesus? Do people call out Christ imagery when they see us? Are we living the way of the cross? Because if we are, it'll lead to spiritual and physical transformation. There should be physical transformations that are taking place in your life and in mine. Death to self and our wants means that we die to how we spend our money. It means that we die to how we spend our time. It means we die to some of the pursuits that this world deems to be most important. There should be a physical difference in how we live our lives because of the work that Jesus is doing in us. There should be a marked difference. The way we speak, the, 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 the habits that we form, the actions that we engage in, there should be a physical difference, but there should also be a spiritual difference that takes place as well. As we take up our cross, we should allow Jesus to change us and, 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 our, and the greed that we have is turned away. The, the lust that we experience should be removed. The jealousy that we experience, the backbiting, the gossip, the whatever, the anger, those things should be changing. There should be spiritual and physical transformations that take place in us. And here's what I just believe. And I don't understand this. I don't, I wish, I wish, I wish I had like a list of five things that you could do. Like just do this, do that. You know, all the, I wish I had, I, I don't. All I have is take up your cross and follow Jesus. Because for Jesus, when he took his cross up and he died a sacrificial death, supernatural things took place. Physical things were changed. Spiritual things were changed. And I don't, I don't understand how it works. I just believe and I just know from what I'm reading here that when we take up our cross and we die, we live sacrificially and selflessly, that supernatural things take place, not only in us, but then the centurions that are around us begin to say, oh my goodness, this is a son or a daughter of the living God. Look at what has happened through their life and the way they have lived. In church, there are so many ways that we try to approach this life. We try to win and, and, and convince and, and, you know, and, and try to encourage people to follow Jesus. And I just think that I, I, I don't know how else to explain it except just to say, take up your cross, follow him, die to yourself, 
sacrifice and give and give and give. And sometimes you'll feel like you're not sure what you're doing. You're not sure where God is. Give and put your faith and your trust in him because it's not ultimately about what you're doing, but it's about God working his supernatural power through you. And so today, church, the question is, does your life reflect the image and actions of Jesus? Do people see that Christ imagery in you for real? Or is it just a surface level thing? And I believe that as we do this, we will make a profound difference in the lives of our neighbors and our family members and our friends and ultimately the Riverbend area when we take up our cross and follow after him. And when we get to the end of our lives and when we breathe our last, I, I, I believe we will have made an impact on the world, not because of us, but because of what the Lord has done as we've been faithful to follow after him. So let's commit ourselves to do that today. Let's pray. Jesus, we put our trust in you and we recognize our great, our great need for you. This, this passage is a tough one. We don't like thinking about Jesus being abandoned by the Father on the cross, but we're so grateful that Jesus took on our sin so that we could be redeemed and made whole. And so Father, I pray for those who are here, perhaps those who are watching who just feel like they have sinned too much or they are too far gone or that they have to somehow earn or work their way back. I pray right now they would recognize that Jesus bought them with his blood, a high price. And all that remains is for them to accept that sacrifice, to call out to you, confess their sins and to make you Savior and Lord of their lives. And I pray that as they do that, they would experience the beginnings, the rumblings of new creation as you transform them and make them into the son and the daughter that you desire them to be. But God, I pray for us here who are believers, who've been in this for a while. Sometimes the cross becomes just something that uh, is kind of tacked on to our lives. The cross becomes something that we recognize, we are appreciative of, but sometimes uh, we don't carry it to its fullness. And so Father, today I pray you would help us to really, really consider, are we reflecting the image of Christ to the world around us? Are we taking up our cross and following after him? God, I pray that there would be spiritual and physical transformation uh, in not only in our own lives, but in the lives of the people around us. I pray, God, I pray for the Roman centurions, the, the unsaved, the people that are lost, the people that are far from you that we come in contact with. Oh God, would you use us through our sacrifice, through our, our, our service to your kingdom, would you use us to be able to open their eyes to who you are? Help us, we pray. Use us for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? Our worship team's gonna lead us in a final song. I'm gonna invite our prayer team to come forward. If you could just come on up. If you need prayer for any reason, you got a situation that's going on, you, anything, something related to the message or not, these folks are here to pray with you and support you, encourage you. Can I encourage you today? Let's just uh, take some time to reflect on that question. Uh, I'm gonna do that by kneeling down at the stairs here. We call this the altar. I'm gonna just put myself before him and say, all right, Jesus, I'm gonna give myself to you, all that I have and all that I am. So maybe you need to physically move your body just to express what you want God to do in you today. I encourage you to come forward and pray. Otherwise, let's stand and worship. Let's, let's reflect. And this song is gonna speak about uh, what he's done for us. And so let's worship him for the work that he's done on the cross, but let's consider our response to that. Our worship isn't just with hands lifted high, but it's hands outstretched on our cross as we live sacrificially for him. Worship team, would you lead us? pieces broken and scattered in mercy
Most of us, at least many of us in the room here today have experienced God's grace and His goodness and His love. And um, we sing about that like in this song. And I just like, we need to allow that 
realization to be the motivation for us going out. Like what he has done for us, now we need to do for others. And it's not that we're saving them. Don't, like, don't get me wrong in that. But in the sense that the veil is torn and the presence is out amongst his people, we are his hands and feet to go lay ourselves down and to break ourselves open and apart and be used by him. And so like, does the world see the love in our eyes so they can even see the love in his eyes? Do we live out this thing? Or do, and so church, my prayer is just simply, and I, again, like I don't understand it. I wish I had like nice, easy steps, but I don't. Just my prayer for us this week is that our church will be a church that lives out this selfless, sacrificial kind of life. It's a strong and a powerful commitment to live selflessly. It's not, a, we're not talking about weakness, letting people roll over us. No, we're talking about doing it the way that our savior did it. Because I just believe that when we do that, the world will be transformed. Everything will change, the physical, the spiritual. And it happens when you and I really, really take up our cross and we follow him to the complete implication of what that means for our lives or for our deaths. I shared in the first service, I sometimes check out other preachers when they do their messages. I didn't call this message this, but he called the message on this passage. He called it, God is dead, you're next. <laughs> Obviously, there's this kind of a, but, but are you, are you willing? And I just like, are you willing? Are you willing to say, I'm taking that cross to wherever it leads? Because I'm just saying, that's what we need to do as a church. So that's my prayer. Will you take the cross? My prayer is that you would take the cross to where it leads. And then in so doing, the centurions of your life would behold the glory of the living God and they would enter into relationship with him. That it wouldn't just be your friends or your neighbors, but that the entire Riverbend area would be transformed because of our church that sacrificially and selflessly lives and follows the way of Jesus. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. And may he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Have a great rest of the day. Grab a shoebox on the way out. Sacrifice for some kids around the world. Um, we'll see you on Wednesday for our prayer and worship time. God bless. Have a great rest of the day. Say hello to somebody on the way out.